still in chapter 11? 10? 10. I've been out of town most weeks, so I don't get to go. Uh, Pathfinders Club. I was planning to attend the Gillette, Wyoming in August. Please remember to support them in your offerings. Uh, they still need, uh, are we, they still need a full 5,000 or that's the total goal, Bart? Mm-hmm. Okay. So if you are able to support the Pathfinders in the Gillette, Wyoming trip, please do so. Your tithe and offering will be supported to them uh, at small contribution. It would even help. So, and then a big one that is kind of short here. We forgot to put it in. So it just shows that there's a cleaning bee. Now, what do we mean by a cleaning bee? Wash the windows. Not just clean, vacuum the floors and mop the floors. There's repairs like they've got bird's nest that is trying to build a house in our ACs outside. So we got to clean those out. Um, I'm planning on bringing a pressure washer and things like that to really do some, the concrete in the front needs to be cleaned. It'd be nice to see that white and not all dark gray, brownish color. <clears throat> um, so please, Put this on your calendar because many hands make light work. If we have majority of the church here, we could be done in an hour or two. If we have just a few people here, like two or three, we're going to be here all day. So if you can come and help, even a little bit of help, even if all you're able to do is wash the windows, every little hand would help. So plan on that on Sunday, April 28th. So any other announcements that I have? not put in the bulletin or that are not there. And Linda, would you start our song service? Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Our first song today is number 309, I Surrender All.
Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to thank you for a beautiful, sunshiny Sabbath day. I want to thank you for this opportunity we have to gather together as your people. And Lord, I just pray that uh, you would be ever present in each uh, life and heart that is uh, present, whether here in this facility or whether online. And I just pray that, Lord, you would draw ever close to us. May we sense your presence. May we move toward your presence. And may we experience true worship today because we are in your presence. So bless this service, Lord, to your honor and glory. We plead for the Holy Spirit to be poured out in this place so that each of us individually would experience your goodness and grace. And then us corporately, as a group, as we experience that, may we go out into a world that is in such great need of your love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The opening hymn is O Worship the King. If you look in your bulletin, there is a section there for prayer requests. And if we come to the Lord in prayer, we have those that we need to pray for. Donna Hadley has still have back pain. She's got a surgery scheduled. Uh, Willie Martin's not here. She's got tongue ulcers in her mouth. Uh, Lily and I have been trying to give her some we gave her some activated charcoal to try to absorb the stuff that's in there. Hopefully that'll start getting better. Um, as you notice around us, most of our congregation is kind of missing because of illness. You know, Evie's got a cold, Grandma Lou's got a cold, Linda's got a cold. Um, I don't know why uh, Willie and Diane are not here, but they're not here. Imagine the sickness is going around. Uh, Lori Roberts, um, praying that her foot will continue to heal and that she makes the right decisions. And then Jan Wheeler, suffering from uh, fibromyalgia. And we should probably even put um, Lenny Wheeler in there because he's got Parkinson's, the shaking of the hands. And then Barb Hemingway's niece, Tammy, had passed away from uh, 
stroke, and then whatever complications took place after that. Right? Am I correct? A heart attack. Okay. And then Randy's grandson is scheduled for a open heart surgery. Now, how old is he? 21. And this is his fourth one. This is his fourth one. Oh. Mm -hmm. Well, let's keep him in our prayer. Any other prayer request? Steve? Yeah, the part? On the way to church this morning, I got an email from the secretary of the women's ministry up in the retreat at Camp Stop this weekend. And she says there was ice on the boardwalk and the lady fell about her arm and she was at the hospital. Mm. So let's remember the, the group up there and that lady. Yep. Any other prayer requests or praises? I do too. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Mark? I just I'm praying for more of the group is getting baptized this morning. Yes, that's another praise. Yep. I pray that there's a change of season. It's not so rainy today on the Sabbath. So I've been down towards Indianapolis this week and it's rained every single day. I don't know what it did here. Did it, did it do the same? Pretty much. <laughs> okay. Um, any others? I pray God to keep us our tulips from our garden. Yeah? Mm -hmm. This blooming of the seasons is coming about. Yeah. Lord? I praise God that I made it today because I was in so much pain. And I just couldn't stand it. And I actually had an hour before I was supposed to get the pain pill. I just couldn't handle it. So I yeah. had to take Any others? And shall we go to the Lord in prayer? Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to pray. Lord, we have those on our prayer list. It seems like sometimes our list is long and sometimes it's short. But Lord, it reminds us that we are dependent on you and that we need you with us always. Lord, we ask that you would help those who are sick, those who are hurt, those who are suffering from pain. Lord, we tell that as this world sin increases the pains and the aches and the other things that sin brings about, even the thorns and the thistles, which weren't part of Eden's creation. Lord, it's because of rebellion that things don't turn out the way we would think that they should. But in a holy atmosphere, there is nothing but love and peace and joy. No pain, no sorrow, no sadness. Lord, we ask that you would help us. Within each of us, our new heart to create a new way of thinking, a new way of acting, a new way of speaking, a new love in our hearts, and that's the love of God. Lord, we have the love now. Lord, we ask that you would renew it. Help us to think of others first before we think of ourselves. Not to speak a harsh word or a, even a, think of an evil thought, but Lord, may we do all things to your glory and to your, and to your love. Give us guidance that we may be kind to others. Speak nicely. Speak the love of Jesus to everyone. Lord, we ask that you would bless us in the hearing of your word this morning. Guide us through understanding. And Lord, for those who are watching online, and those who may catch this later, may it speak to their hearts just the same as it speaks to us. Lord, send your Holy Spirit where he needs to go. He needs to go with each of us. Not that we may use the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit will use us for your will. Lord, please bless us and please hear our prayer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
Today's tithe and faith offering is for Hope Channel International. Give hope through your offering today. The impact of Hope Channel is evident in the inspiring stories of God's children like Pastor Ross, a baby Aurora. Ross overcame drug addiction and became an ordained Seventh-day Adventist pastor after discovering Hope Sabbath School. Following baby Aurora's I'm not good with medical terms. Biat Biatral plexus injury at birth. She was miraculously healed thanks to most of our watched Let's Pray program and prayers on her behalf from our global community. With your offering today, Hope Channel can continue to share the transforming love of Jesus Christ with people all over the world, producing high quality Christian content, each new audience in innovative ways. Our Hope Study platform is online and offers Bible studies on a range of topics. So far, over 300,000 people started the course. Just one year after the platform went live, people are hungering for Bible truth. As we read Proverbs 11.25, Whosoever brings blessings will be enriched, and who and one who waters will be watered himself. By faithful support, Hope Channel International, you are not only blessing others, but yourself as well, by bringing hope to these, to those who need it, and most by telling them of the love of Christ. After celebrating 20 years of Hope Channel and reaching over 80 countries with the Adventist message, let's make 2024 the most impactful year yet in sharing hope in Jesus and with people everywhere. May the deacons come forward and take up the offering. opportunity to give to the church, not just to the church, but also to Hope Channel International, that it may reach not just here in the United States, but also in other countries, as it's reached already 80 countries. Lord, we ask that what Hope Channel does will reach not just the countries, but the individual hearts of each and every individual that hears the program. Lord, there are people out there that are wanting to know the truth. But if nobody's willing to share the truth, the truth will struggle to go forward. Lord, we ask that you would use us as a person and an individual and a church that can share your word with those around us. Lord, let our lips not be sealed, 
but open to share the word and the truth of your word. Lord, please bless the offering today and the tithe and offering that they go to the right resources and to the right functions to share the gospel. We ask a blessing over our offering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Pastor has a children's story. So if the kids would come up and sit in the front row, Pastor has a children's story for you. share one verse with you. I'm going to tell two stories here that, that are, I think, important for us to hear. And now, this is sort of, if you, if you were last week, which I believe you guys were, it's sort of a continuation of last week, but I want to bring a little bit more to what I talked about last week. And I'm going to be reading in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12. Now, the words I'm going to use here are there's two phrases that, that, that kind of oppose one another and are against one another, if you would. And you're going to hear that. But I want you to say it here and it also it results in. Okay? And I'll kind of repeat that afterwards so you understand what I'm saying. But I, it doesn't exactly say that, but that's really what it means here. So Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12 says, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. So in other words, hatred... As a result of hatred, it stirs up strife. As a result of love, it covers all sins. Okay? So that's where I wanted to go with that. So, we talked about last week that, that people um, sometimes pick on us. Sometimes there's bullies out there. Sometimes there's people that are really mean. And sometimes it's really hard to respond to those people. But I want to give you a concept today that I think will help you. Because it's helped me a lot. I'm not trying to say I get good results with it all the time, but I want to follow this verse because sometimes when I react in a more hateful, spiteful way, it just causes more problems, stirs up more strife, as the Bible says. I want to respond in a loving way that, that God wants us to respond. So I know none of you drive, and if you have driven, well, I'm not going to talk about that, whether you've driven or not, but... Um, <laughs> But most of you have never really driven out on the road by yourself, we'll put it that way. And as you're, you're driving, you may have experienced this with your parents driving. And, and, and maybe they kind of deserved it or something. Because I know that when I drive, sometimes I'm not paying as close attention to people. And you know what I do? I cut people off. Any adults ever cut anyone off out there before? Yeah? I thought everybody has. Okay? And you don't intend to, but that person just lays on their horn and they're just, ah! You know, you look in the mirror and that's what they're doing, okay? And then they sometimes pull around you, slam them, they do all kinds of things out there, okay? A road rage, right? Sometimes they give hand signals to you that you don't want to do. So, and, and, and I just, I don't know what else to do, but I, and I don't want to be in your face like, you know, how dare you treat me this way? I was, it was a mistake. Can't you understand that? Because they don't understand that. They don't know what I was doing or why I was ignoring them and I cut them off. Okay? So I kind of just smile and you know, just kind of put up my hand and say, I'm kind of sorry. That's the best I can do, right? Because you can't communicate out the window or anything like that. But I thought of another way that really helps me to understand people that get angry with you in these situations. Okay? And one of those ways is to realize that when people react in such a way, okay? now sometimes when people cut me off, it's like, whoa, what's going on? How, they didn't see me or whatever. That's how I usually react. I don't react with, with the, the hand signals that they try to give me or my horn. Maybe I'll pump up my horn a little bit, but I don't sit there and lay on my horn. Because that could scare someone. You, know, you sort of punch your horn a little bit and say, hey, I'm here. <laughs> don't, don't be looking around. You know, that's usually what I, I try to do. But this is what I want you to pull away from my story. Okay? This is really what's important. When people hurt you. It's usually because they're hurting. Now, I want to go on record here. I want you to hear what I'm going to say next because this is important to this. Because 
you know, you may be thinking in your mind, well, that's just no reason for them to hurt me because they're hurting, and that's true. All I want you to recognize is that people are hurting, okay? That does not give them an excuse to hurt you, okay? That is not a good enough reason to hurt anyone else, never, okay? Not making an excuse for anybody because sometimes people hurt you, and it's bad, okay? I'm not talking physically, I'm talking emotion, I'm talking all kinds of pain, okay? Hopefully you'll never experience it, but if you have, you know what I'm talking about. It's not right that they will hurt you. I want you to recognize that people are hurting out there. There's a lot of people hurting. They don't even have to do anything bad to you to know that people are hurting. But when people try to hurt you, at least in your mind say, they must be hurting. And I can respond in a loving way. That doesn't mean you're, you're, they're, you know, they're your best friend and you go hang out with them as if they're your best friend. That's not the type of love I'm talking about. You can respond in a loving way by saying, all right, they're hurting, and I'm going to just try not to respond in a bad way because what does it say? It says hatred stirs up strife, and I don't want to stir up more strife. I want to stir up love in their lives. Right? So this is another thing. It's kind of a close, it's sort of a, a second lesson, but it's, 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 it's still on the same pathway. If you've ever been sitting in your house or in a classroom or anywhere or in your car and an ambulance goes by, what do you, what's the first thought that comes to your mind? Somebody's hurt, okay? And they're hurting. Now, they may not be hurting someone else, or maybe they did hurt someone, <laughs> and they're hurting too because of an accident or whatever. It doesn't even matter. They're hurting. Our first response to act with compassion like Jesus and realize they're hurting and we need to pray for them. Just like that person that hurt you, pray for them. That doesn't mean that it's going to be a miracle to turn right around and they're going to treat you with love and respect. It doesn't mean that the person in the ambulance that's hurting is just going to automatically be healed. Maybe, but it doesn't mean that. What it means is we need to have compassion for people who are hurting. And we need to do all we can to take them to Jesus. Okay? And it's Jesus that can help their pain. Okay? Jesus is the only one that can help their pain. Sure, the ambulance goes to the doctor. The doctor may give them a little bit of drugs to relieve their pain, if it's physical pain or whatever. And I'm not trying to say that can't happen, but that doesn't get rid of the pain usually. When that drug wears off, guess what? Pain's back. Been there, done that. <laughs> I've been there. And, and, and so that's, doctors in general can't 100% solve your problems. Now they can fix some things, and I'm not trying to say they, they can't fix a lot of things, but, but we need to depend on Jesus more. We need to go to Jesus more when people are in pain. Okay? If you know someone that's in pain physically, pray for them. If you know that someone's in pain because they're treating you meanly, Meanly, what do you do? Pray for them. Okay? Take that attitude to take them to Jesus. And I can guarantee you, your attitude will change much better. Okay? That's what it truly means. But love covers a multitude of sins. It doesn't mean that, all right, it's all right that they sin. That's not what that passage means. It just means that as a result of me loving them through prayer, through treating them more kindly, guess what? They're going to see that I need to turn my ways, and it will cover their sin by them turning their back on sin and turning their way to God. That's what I'm hoping you hear today. Okay? No matter your story, no matter how much people hurt you, people cut you off when you eventually get out there and drive, love them. Now, you can't reach out and give them a hug. They probably wouldn't let you do that anyways, even if you could. <laughs> but you can pray for them. That's the best love we can do for anyone, is pray for people. Okay? So let me pray for you right now, pray for me right now, pray for all these people out here right now that we will respond in love rather than in irritation or anger. Okay? Hurting people hurt people. You may be hurting, but that doesn't give you a right to hurt someone. Pray that God would fill your heart with love, whether you're hurting or whether someone else is hurting and they try to hurt you back. So let's pray. Dear Jesus, we are so grateful that you have a way let me tell you, Father, sometimes it's hard to respond kindly to people who treat us badly. But I thank you that you set the example when you sent, you, you came to this earth and, and, and you died on the cross. You were in major pain, 
not just physical pain, but emotional pain to know that, that, that my sin nailed you there on the cross. But you recognized that I was in pain because of the sin in my life, and you loved me anyways, and you went the full way on the cross to pay my price, even though I didn't treat you well. And I just pray that we would see that example, and we respond to it, and we would love everyone we come in contact with, no matter what, no matter how they treat us. May we show the love of Christ to them, not just in, not just in actions, but in prayer, because you are the only one that can truly heal their pain. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you, guys. It is now time for special music, so if the choir could come forth and stand up here in the middle in the front. Now, if you would open your Bibles, we have our scripture reading, and found in Revelation, the second to the last chapter of Revelation, chapter 21. And we'll be reading verses 1 through 7. Revelation chapter 21, 1 through 7. 
And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they, will, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that, is set, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. And he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. May there be a blessing to the reading of the word of God. After I hand it over to you. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. It's good to be with you. I'm glad you guys stayed. I kind of wish I could go and see Reuben's baptism, but uh, I just heard about it yesterday and you know, couldn't find anyone to replace me for a sermon that quick anyway. But that's all right. We're going to have a good time here, have a good message for you. And it doesn't look like a very good message when we think pain and evil. Ugh, you know, none of us like pain and evil, right? None of us like it. But my hope is, is that you'll come away with a blessing as we discuss this important topic. Now, remember our, our series as we've been going through it. You know, we've been talking about different topics, but we're asking you to think different, right? We're asking you to think different about these topics. Because too many people, when they hear those topics, they rise up and go, ah, this is what I think. But I believe we need to think different about each of these topics. The reason that the call here is to think different is because Satan is so busy, and get this, and successful, and I may add, at getting us to think different about the character of God. He was so successful that he convinced a third of the angels in heaven to turn away from the way of God. He was so successful that he convinced the first two, the perfect two, first two perfect human beings to believe a lie that God had their best interest at heart. Satan has been so successful that Satan's favorite verse in the Bible is this one right here. And you know, guys know this verse well, but this is his favorite one. Get it. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He loves that verse. Why does he love that verse? Because it's his fault that they have fallen short of the glory of God. Now, there's not a single person except Jesus Christ that has not fallen for his lies. That's a sad story. I don't like to admit it, but it's true. It's true. Every single person here has fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have, because we've all sinned. Satan has, without much resistance, infiltrated every church of the land to spread his cancerous doctrine that God is bad and his character is not all that loving. Jesus, while on this earth, made a profound quote trying to get the Pharisees to think different about their interpretation of the character of God. We read here in John, or, um, oh, yep, it is John. I did not change the Roman, the, the verse in the bottom, but it's John chapter 8, verses 44 and 45. And it reads, he's talking to the Pharisees here. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Verse 45, because I tell the truth, 
You do not believe me. Now, it would be well for you to go through and read that whole section of Scripture to get the whole context. But I just brought up these one verses where Jesus is, is responding to these Pharisees, telling them that your fathers of the father of the devil are a liar. You're believing a lie rather than the truth that I'm presenting to you. The real question that needs to be answered in order to think different is this. Who are you going to believe? The one who tells the truth or the one who tells a lie? Now, that's an obvious question. In our minds, we say, well, well duh, Pastor, we're going to believe the truth. Amen. And that's the way it should be. But do we? And that's the sad story that continues to go on. Do we believe the truth rather than the lie? Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer, and let's dig further into this topic today. So let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you. I thank you that you are a God who cares, a God who loves, a God who desires our heart and every aspect of our life. And I just pray that, Lord, as we enter this topic, we would think different. We would open our hearts to a, to, to a different thought pattern rather than just simply believing what we've been told, believing possibly a lie. And I just pray that each one here would go away with a greater truth in our heart and we would grow greater and greater and more and more closer to our Lord and Savior. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the question that needs to be answered, the question that has been asked in many ways by mostly every human being, if God is so good, then why do we have pain and evil? Why do we have it? If God is so good, then why do we have pain and evil? Isn't God all-powerful? Isn't God all-knowing? Isn't God all-loving? Now, I'm not trying to cast any doubt on the character of God when I'm when doing these, but these are actually very good questions in light of what the world thinks of God, and, and they deserve a good answer. But if God is so good, then why do bad things happen to good people? Very good question, right? Now, from a humanistic point of view, in other words, these are humans that depend on themselves. Okay? And, and, and believe me, it's not just a few people out there just sitting in a, uh, some conference room discussing you know, what we should think and what we should do. This humanistic view is widespread throughout the whole world. So from a humanistic point of view, these are the questions, according to them, that can't be answered. Without God, people have to jump to the conclusion that ultimately there really is no purpose or meaning in life. I mean, think about it. There's really no meaning or purpose to life if God is really not there, if God is not a part of our equation. And if there is no meaning to life, then in reality, get this, there really is no good or evil. Okay? I just want you to kind of wrap your mind around it. I know that sometimes this is a little hard to take because we're not of that ilk. We don't believe this because we're here. We believe in what the Bible says. But this is really what people believe out there. And if all this is true, that there really is no good or evil, then humans are simply brought down to an animalistic reality. Remember this in, in, in understanding, uh, uh, you know, in, in an understanding based on the belief that there is no God. And all life as we know it is just a process of evolutionary theory. This is what we come to the conclusion with when we don't include God in the picture. And some people, even though uh, they believe in a God, they, they still believe in, in this evolutionary theory. And they try to incorporate it, amalgamate, if you would, uh, a picture of God with the theory of evolution. You and I stand here today, know that what, I'm what I've just said is just a bunch of bunk in the sense that, there, you know, there's no meaning to life, okay? And, and we might as well just do whatever we want. There's no good. There's no evil. You are here today because we know there is more to life than just simply existing. The true um, intricacies of life couldn't have just evolved. And that is why the story of creation 
is such an important part in our life. It is what gives us meaning and purpose. The Genesis account starts out with these profound words. In the beginning, God. Goes on to say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. After each day, God said something about each day. What did he say? What did he say? Do you remember what he said about each day? It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good, good, good. And they ultimately came to the conclusion that it's very good. Okay? Good, 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 very good. Now, I had to, I had to really go through and study this out because I just thought that there was just five goods and one very good. But no, it's really six goods because he talks about every day as being good. But he came to that ultimate conclusion when he stood back and looked at all his creations. And he says, ah, very good. Very good. God's intent of everything he created was good. No pain, no evil, just good. God, who is love, created a world for his people. And everything he created It was good. Through the name given to the first home for the human beings explains God's true intent of this good gift to us. Eden is really a word that just means pleasure. God created so that we could experience pleasure. Now, just want to say here, not in my notes, just came to my mind, and I'm going to say it like this first, and I've said it to you in other sermons like this. For every one of God's truths, Satan has at least one deception, right? So when we think of Eden, okay, the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Pleasure, our minds might start to wander and say, well, not all pleasures are good, and that would be true, okay? Why? Because Satan has warped or, or somehow infiltrated God's true pleasure and created wickedness out of it. Okay? Just putting a blunt to you. That's exactly what he did. God God created everything good, even pleasure he created good, but Satan has somehow warped it and turned it so that it's not good. God's intent was to express to his crowning act of creation was to be good and pleasureful. His intent was for us to be fruitful and multiply this other-centeredness of God that he expressed as intention for the human interaction. What do I mean by that? You see, everything that God did was other-centered. It was not just for himself. Now, don't get me wrong. When, When we do good to people, you know as well as I do, we experience joy to see the look on their face. Do we not? Right? We say, wow, this is such an awesome feeling just to see them receive the gift that I've given them, okay? That's why God says it's more blessed to what? Give than to receive. And it is. It's a blessing to us. And so God does receive a blessing from giving, but it's it's for others, not for himself, okay? We'll we'll get to this, but uh, I just want you to wrap your mind around this other-centeredness that God has intended for us. You see, other-centeredness is really the very definition of love. Okay? I just want you to think about this as we go through, because that's ultimately what we're going to come to in the end. But when sin came on the scene, the theme of other-centeredness abruptly stopped, and self-centeredness came rushing in. Blame, shame, self-protectedness, starting to cast the blame. Well, the woman who you gave me, and what did she say? Well, that snake deceived me. Everyone, it's not my fault. Some, you know, what, what did, those of you who are old, old enough to re- remember this, what did old Flip Wilson said? The devil made me do it. Did, did he not remember that? The devil made me. The devil didn't make you do anything for us. We choose to do what the devil wants us to do because he's tempted us and we say, oh, that looks good and I'm going to do it. Okay? But that's really who it comes from, that self-centeredness. When I choose to go Satan's way rather than God's way. Now, we don't like to hear this because we know sin. I mean, if, 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 if I said nothing else in this sermon, we know that sin ultimately resi- re, um, results in, in, in misery. 
Okay? It results in misery. And other-centeredness results in, in, in just outer uh, uh, joy that just overflows. Okay? This is the picture when we, when we are, are self-centered. This is the picture of a life without God. Putting it bluntly. It's a picture of a life without God. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, I want to bring this verse to your attention. I, I like it in this version. You can read it in your own version, and, and, and you can come to your own conclusion. But in the New Century version, this is what it says, and I like how it says this. It says, one thing I have learned, God made people good. Is that not what we read in Genesis? Okay, he does, right? But they, the people, have found all kinds of ways to be what? To be bad. Found in Ecclesiastes 7:29. One thing I've learned: God made people good, but they, us, all of us, have made all kinds of ways to be bad. And even though God made everything good, man, in his choice, put God's goodness aside and has found all kinds of ways to make things bad. Now, some may try to put the blame back on God. If God is so good, then then why is there so much evil in pain. Some may try to say, if God were so good, couldn't he have foresaw the choice that humans were to make and all kinds of ways they were to be bad? Couldn't he foresee that and, and change it and do something about it? The answer is yes. He could have. He is all powerful. Okay, I believe that from the bottom of my heart. God does give all a free choice. Okay, so once again, we come back to that profound verse that, that describes God. 1 John 4, 8, God is love. God is love. We also find in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the earth. Okay? God's intent was to make us like him, okay? And we were. We were created just like him. But notice he gave us a job to do. Remember all the humanistic point of views that say, well, you know, you know, we're, uh, life is meaningless. Well, what did God do here in creation? He gave what? Dominion. He gave us to have dominion over all the earth. On that same topic, we find in Psalm 115, verse 16, it says, the heaven... Even the heavens are the Lord's, okay? Everything's the Lord's. We can, we can go to verses that say that too. But get this. But the earth he has given to the children of men, okay? He's given us responsibility to take care of the earth. And that's a good thing. But you and I both know, all of us know, what we have done to the earth. God gave humans a free will. God gave to humans a purpose. God gave to humans a responsibility to take care of the earth. Notice this goes contrary to the humanistic point of view that there is no meaning in life. God gave us meaning, but what do we do with that meaning? So a God of love created humans with a free will. This free will gave us, as humans, with a free choice. This free choice has risks, but the risks did not have to be. If we as humans had chosen to follow God's perfect way, we would continually and exponentially, mind you, grow in greater and greater love for God and for each other. But as history tells the story, we use that free choice for self. And the risk became God's nightmare. And that free choice to not follow God's plan led to pain and evil, okay? So it's not part of God's plans, and we say, well, why did God even create if he knew it was going to happen? Because God knows all. Yes, he does know all. He does know all. We must always keep before us that love is a risk. True love never forces. You can call me a liar if you want, but I don't think you can call me a liar on that one. True love never forces. True love never coerces. True love always gives a free choice. 
Now, I find it very interesting <laughs> that in the insurance world, that, that when a natural disaster hits, they always refer to it as what? Acts of God. Okay? Act of God. Deer hits your car. It's an act of God. Okay? They always do. They, they want to blame God for it for some reason. The only fault that God has in the natural disasters is that he chose to be other-centered and to love. And with love is a risk. Okay? There was a risk, and he knew it. And he knew what would happen, too. Now, we take a very similar risk when we, out of love, choose to procreate and have children. Do we not? The true love we have for those children come with a risk because we love, we don't force, we don't coerce those children to follow our path, nor do we do that for them to follow the path of God. We allow because, we, uh, because of love. A free choice for those kids. Do we not? Even though we know that free choice could result in pain and evil. Every parent knows that result of pain and evil when that child makes their own choice and does something that, that would be contrary to what we would believe is right or, more importantly, contrary to what God thinks is right. Turn to our scripture reading today in Revelation chapter 21. I want to just, uh, just go over verses 1 through 4 here. You can read the rest of it. It's, it's a great verse. It's a great read. But I want to just focus on something here in Revelation chapter 21. And we're going to comment as we go along here just in a few spots. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but, but I definitely want to bring your attention back to our scripture reading in Revelation 21, starting in verse 1, and we're going to read through verse 4. And this is John the Revelator talking here. He says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Okay? Here it is. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Now, this is an important verse when we really start thinking about it. All throughout the history of Scripture, and even to this day, when we don't have uh, 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 an extension of Scripture in the sense of adding to the book of the Bible, we can see that the theme of the Bible ultimately is, is that God desires to be with his people. We find that word Emmanuel, okay? God with us. God always desires to be with his people. Well, he knows how bad we are. We don't have to pretend that we're good. We don't have to pretend that anything bad has happened or hasn't happened, you know, in our minds. God already knows. And God's not sitting by waiting for us to strike us down with lightning, as some people would think, in cartoons and what have you. Or then, have you ever had anyone said this? Don't stand next to me. God's going to strike with lightning. You might be hit too. Okay? That's not God. God knows you're bad but he loves you anyways. He loves you anyways. And this is, this is huge, okay? He desires to be with you and you with him. It's the theme of all scripture. That's why he came as a baby. Emmanuel, God with us. It's really a cool theme when you really start studying that out throughout scripture. All the pain in the world. I didn't finish reading. I better finish reading before we go on. And get this. This is, this, is, this is the cool verse. This is what I wanted to conclude with this verse. It's, it's why it's so important not to forget it. Verse 4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Why is there tears in people's eyes? Pain, sorrow, exactly. Okay? God's going to wipe those away. Don't ever get the idea. This is sort of a sidebar bonus. You don't have to pay any extra for this, this comment. A lot of people think that, you know, you ever heard that, that phrase, there's no tears past the gate of heaven. I may totally have misquoted that. But I've heard that before. That's not what it says. There will be tears in heaven. My friends, there's going to be tears when God calls fire down from heaven and destroy sin because people will be destroyed with it. There'll be tears. There'll be tears in God's eyes. There'll be tears in your eyes because you know that loved ones are being destroyed for all eternity. Okay? So that's not what it means. It does what it means what it says, that God's going to wipe away your tears. God's going to comfort you. He's going to come in close to you, okay? 
So God's going to wipe every tear from their eyes. And get this, this is the promise of God. There shall be no more what? Does death bring pain? Yep. There'll be no more death. Nor sorrow. Does sorrow bring pain? There will be, um, I lost my place here. There will be no more crying. We already concluded that when you're crying, there's pain. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Okay? God has brought it to its full conclusion. A lot of people say, well, why doesn't he do it now? If he does it now, it's not ready to end pain. I hate to say it. I wish it was. I wish pain would just go away. I wish Jesus would come right now. I really do. But that's not part of his plan yet. He's got to let sin run its full course. Otherwise, Satan will say, see, you just pulled them out too early. You give them a few more times. Isn't that what he said to Job? Yeah, you take your hand away from Job, and, and you'll see how long it takes before he curses you. Job didn't curse God. Okay? Understand. Understand this. That all pain in the world can be traced to evil. All evil can be ultimately traced to free will. Now, I'm not talking about those immediate actions. When I decide to do something wrong, something sinful, and all of a sudden, you know, whoa, now I'm going to experience the wrath of God. That's not what I'm talking about here. What I am talking about is that, that the, all the collective free choices of all humanity throughout history has caused this world pain and evil. As we choose to ignore the will of God, it leads to pain and evil that we feel today. Okay? So it's not like just one thing. You do something wrong and it's like, wham, there you go. You got what you deserve. No, we're not talking about that. That's not how God operates. God, in his ultimate uh, plan and will for the world is for us to experience his love, his love. If we had chosen to do as he had willed, we would have experienced uh, the other centeredness of God and the full love of God's character. And this world would have been a totally different place. We would, I believe at this point in time, Satan would have been totally annihilated because we would all realize that that was the cause of us choosing Satan over God. But we choose to, con to, to continue to be self-centered in love for ourselves, and the result in the world is that it is broken, filled with pain and evil. And even though we as humans have, have chosen to be self in a self-centered way, there is hope, my friends. Hope in a better way when Jesus destroys sin for the final time. And the Bible promises when that happens, he, he points forward that affliction will not arise a second time. And that's a wonderful promise. I look forward to that promise just like anyone else here. That's a good promise. But know this, even though that is what we are ultimately longing for, we can still experience true love here and now. Now, I know, I know, it will never be perfect as, as it would have been if we had chose not to sin. But to choose love, to choose to be other-centered now, will result in the best life we can experience in the here and the now. I, 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 you know, as I told the kids in the children's story, I want them to experience and be more compassionate when people hurt one another and hurt them or when people are in pain. Let's just leave that as a general statement. Because by having compassion on them, knowing that they're in pain and having compassion on them, not to excuse their actions. There is no excuse for sin in your life, my life, or anyone else who hurts you. No excuse. Not trying to excuse sin in the least. But when we reach out with love, they can see a greater picture of Jesus. We can experience a greater joy because we're offering love rather than what maybe they deserve. Even though 
This is our ultimate longing, to see a world free of pain. We can choose to love regardless, choose to be other-centered. And this will result in that best experience we can experience in the here and now. To love, like Jesus loved you, will be the only way that others that we can show others a better way to choose and to live who are in pain and evil. And how do I know this? Because in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3, it says, The Lord has appeared of old unto me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, what happens? I have drawn you. Jesus through love, is, it's the only way for anyone's heart to be reached is through Jesus reaching out his everlasting love towards you and drawing you with that love. That dumb, bad illustration. But if I come up and just slap you as hard as I can, and I say, come on, follow me. You going to follow me? Nope. And you shouldn't follow me if I treat you that way, right? But if I come up and put an arm around you and say, hey, let me show you a better way. And you still may choose not to follow me. That's your choice because that's what love offers is a choice. But you'd be more than likely to follow me if I'm expressing true love to you and you're experiencing true love. Because the only way you can experience true love is if I have the love of Christ in me. I can't fake it. I can't force it. I can't drum up some sort of godly love inside me without experiencing the love of God myself. To love like Jesus loves you will be the only way that we can show a better way to the people who are stuck in their pain and their evil ways. The only way for you um, here today, the only reason that you're, that you're here today is because Jesus has loved you with an everlasting love. You have experienced the love of Christ. Let that love flow out of you now. Let others see Jesus in you so they can experience that love in their, in their soul because that's really what their soul longs for. Every single person out there, I don't care how evil they are, you can think of the worst criminal in the world, they desire for the love in their hearts. They do. They may not accept it because they've been so warped in their, their evilness that somehow they've lost sight of that love. But that's really what their heart longs for. That's what each of us longs for. Let them experience that love as you lead them to the everlasting love and the face-to-face -face with God for all eternity. How many here are ready to think different and let pain and evil shed away for the true love that only God can give? Just simply raise your hand and tell God that. I do. I do. I am so tired of this world. I am so, get this, I'm even more tired than this world. I am so tired of looking in the mirror and seeing that self-centeredness and saying, wow, what an evil person I am. That's how Paul could say, you know, that's how Paul could say, I'm the chief of sinners. Look in the mirror. You'll come to the same conclusion. You, in and of yourself, are an evil person. Now, you may not go out and do mass murders, but you may do that with your mind. That person, if I could ever just have a chance. We do. We need the love of Christ to encompass our hearts. And that is the only way we can give that kind of love to others. Allow Jesus to turn his love into you because that's what he wants to do. He's waiting for it. He's not going to just wait for you to reach a certain point of perfection and saying, all right, now, now I can love you. No, he loves you even in your wickedness, even in your evil. I love Jesus for that. He's not out there trying to do away with us. He is out there trying to win us. And not just you. Everyone in the world, no matter how evil they are, no matter what wickedness they have done. Maybe though some people have done wickedness to you. And maybe when you get to heaven, because of God's love in their heart, they've changed their ways and they will be in heaven living right next door to you. Who knows? But you can be assured if they're there, They've accepted the love of Jesus, and they have a heart change as well. Because they won't be there unless they love Jesus. I want you to have a word of prayer. Asking God to be with our decision. Because even though it's kind of an obvious decision, 
kind of like, duh, yeah, I'm going to choose the love of Christ. It's not easy. Satan's constantly chipping away and trying to work his way into your heart. And so let's pray and let's plead with the Lord to stop that chipping and, and, and to truly accept the love of Christ in our hearts. Heavenly Father, you saw the hands that are raised. Each one of us, Lord, have turned our backs on you. The Bible says so. I believe it. But Lord, I just pray that each one here would fully accept the love of Christ in each of our hearts. And Lord, through that all, we would have compassion on a dying world. We'd have compassion on a world that is just so evil and in pain that when they see the love of Christ shining out of us, they will think different too. And they will want to make the change and accept you as Lord and Savior. And I pray a blessing upon each of us, Lord, because it's not easy when people are treating us bad. That Once again, I told the kids this, Lord, you heard me say that, that we're not talking about being buddy-buddy with people who continually treat us mean, but we can reach out with love and compassion and pray for them. And, and Lord, may you reach their hearts. We want to thank you for this gift of love. And I pray that all of us would experience to the fullest degree so that we can express love, your love, to a dying world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Goes on his closing hymn, O Love That Will Not Let Me Go, hymn 76. Hymn 76. a way, a way for us to just truly come to you. And it's simple, not complicated. You're not waiting for us to reach a certain point of perfection. You're only waiting for us to turn to you. And you will pour your love into us, Lord. You pour your love into us even before we turn to you. And I just pray that, Lord, as we are drawn to you today, that we will exhibit that kind of love, the love of Christ to others, and people will be drawn to not to us, Lord, but we can point them to you and allow them to experience the true love that you have for them as well. So just bless us now as we depart from here. Let us show that love to whoever we come in contact with. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing.